what is wrong with you, man? Of course he wasn't overrated. The man was brilliant. I know, I know. Look, truth be told, I just wanted an excuse to talk about skulls, okay? Well, you should have thought about that before you made that ridiculous title. Disgusting. Paul Skulls. For whatever reason, Paul Scholes is one of the most divisive players in recent football history. People either feel that he was severely underrated or severely overrated. There seems to be no in-between. I mean, I guess you also have Gary Neville who… well… I think he rates Scholes pretty highly, to be fair to him. Anyway, what's up with all the division? The man was great. Albeit a bit reckless in the tackle, he was a passing, positional and long-range genius. You don't win 2 Champions Leagues, 11 Premier Leagues and 3 FA Cups if you're anything but. Having said that, he did retire from international football at only 29 years of age and more or less failed to leave his mark on the national team. Regardless of who you want to put the blame on for that, the story of Skulls and the Three Lions is quite a peculiar one. In any case, today we're going to take a brief look at the career of one of the all-time English greats and find out what all the fuss is about. With that being said, how good was Paul Scholes really? Yo, what's up friends, trust you're all doing well. As always, if you like what you see, do it. Or not. You know, no harm in asking, right? Anyway, let's jump right in. Back to what I previously said in the intro, for a player that causes such a divide amongst fans, his fellow professionals, both teammates and rivals, seem to universally sing high praise for him. The great Pele once stated that if he had played with Paul Scholes, he would have scored way more goals, and considering the fact that Pele's goal count is still rising to this day, that claim should not be taken lightly. Back in 2011, Xavi Hernandez once called him the greatest central midfielder he had seen in the past 15 or 20 years, going even further to state, if he'd been Spanish, he might have been rated more highly. For someone with such a larger-than-life reputation, it would only make sense that his ego and demeanor were similar in stature, right? No, no, no. The man was as boring as they come. And I mean that in the most sincere and complimentary sense of the term. An astute professional that was there to do his job and nothing more. Roy Keane definitely approved. Born in Salford in 1974, Paul Scholes was a rather gifted sportsman. He excelled in not only football but also cricket. Nonetheless, football was his main passion. And as you can imagine, he supported Manchester United from a very young age. So as expected, he was extremely excited when he began training with United at 14 years old, joining them as a trainee at 17. You've probably all heard of the fabled class of 92. This group consisted of a few select members of the legendary Man United youth team that won the 1992 FA Youth Cup. David Beckham, Ryan Giggs, Nicky Butt, Gary Neville and his brother Phil Neville. Hello Philip. Hello Gary. And finally Paul Scholes. This is probably the most famous photo of them and here we have Scholes second from the back. Only thing is, he wasn't exactly part of this group. No, Scholes was actually part of the class of 93 alongside Phil Neville, a youth team that got to the finals of the 1993 FA Youth Cup but unfortunately lost out to Leeds. At the start of his career, many may forget that Scholes was primarily an attacker, mostly deployed as a second striker. Using this as our frame of reference, not only are we going to go over a brief overview of his career, but we're also going to pay close attention to his tactical evolution. By the time he made his debut for the United First team in the 1994-95 season, he was already stellar at many, many things, coming up with 5 goals and 2 assists in 17 appearances. Not the greatest, but not bad for a 20-year-old's first season. This also wasn't United's greatest season in the 90s, losing out on the title to Blackburn Rovers on the final game of the season. Being the auxiliary attacker in what was typically a 4-4-2, sometimes a 4-4-1-1, he would often interlink with the midfield as well as his more advanced striking partner with deadly efficiency. He wasn't exactly a dribbler per se, but his quick feet served him very well in tight spaces. And finally, his composure and finishing ability were also huge assets. This was fully on show in the 1995-96 season. Mark Hughes left United at the end of the 94-95 season, and before that, Eric Cantona decided to practice his striking technique on someone's face. However, Andy Cole had recently been brought into the club and with one striker spot left, Paul Scholes filled the gap. 10 goals and 1 assists this year were more than enough to help United to their third Premier League title and Paul Scholes' first. United did retain the title the next season but due to the arrival of Ole Gunnar Solskjaer and the return of Eric Cantona, competition up top was fierce and even though Cantona left United at the end of the 96-97 season, Teddy Sheringham quickly came in to replace him and Dwight York followed the very next season. Safe to say that the striker role at United had a pretty significant barrier to entry at the time. 
Having said that, when Roy Keane suffered a cruciate ligament injury in 1997, having displayed the characteristics to play in the middle of the park, Skull stepped in as his replacement. And when Keane came back from injury, the two formed one of the best midfield pairs in Premier League history. The best, depending on who you ask. Playing as an 8 now, Skulls' passing range was on display for all to see like never before, moving the ball effectively and making deadly late runs into the danger areas. Having said that, Skulls was still an attacker at heart. This was evidenced through his, uh, enthusiastic approach to tackling. This midfield duo went on to help United to an unprecedented treble and some very, very memorable years indeed. Funnily enough, in the 1999 Champions League, both scored crucial goals in the knockout stages against the Italians, Inter Milan and Juventus, and both didn't even play in the final due to suspension. Losing both of their starting midfielders and still winning the whole thing gives you a bit of an idea of how special this United team was. If you want further proof, check out this video. Anyway, let's fast forward to 2001. Once Sebastian Veron had been brought in to play the deep-lying midfielder role for United. As a result of this, Paul Scholes was moved up top once more as a second striker and paired up with Ruben Nistelrooy. Adding on to that, this time Scholes was the one who displaced the likes of Andy Cole, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer and Dwight York. On a personal level, this period was also the most prolific in his career, scoring 31 goals over the next two seasons, including 14 in the 2002-03 season. Despite this, this period was rather forgetful for United as Arsenal and Chelsea took control of the league for some time. However, starting around roughly 2006 in his early 30s, Scholes' final evolution into the Regista role was complete. Oh no, said the rest of the league. Just ask Thierry Henry. But I have to go with Paul Scholes. Paul Scholes was just... Every time we were playing them, we needed to find a way to stop him. <laughs> He's just no, it's, 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 not, you don't, you don't, it's a great finish to this show. I mean, we, <laughs> we, we finished so awesome. Now playing deep, the trademark crossfield sprays came into full effect. Neat little dribbles in the center of the park, short quick interplay, and the ability to effortlessly dictate the flow of the game. The man was at the peak of his powers. Although he played as an attacker for large portions of his career, he was more or less tossed with sitting in and around the halfway line and dictating proceedings. However, he did retain the composure and killer instinct that got him this far and was certainly able to showcase it when required. Just take a look at this goal scored against Blackburn Rovers in 2007. For context, this was a must-win match deep into the season that United were trailing in. This was the equaliser that set off a 4-1 comeback. Composure. His long-range shots were also still elite, as we can see here. Mad. Over the next few years, United went on to dominate the league with Scholes playing a starring role. He finally got to start in a Champions League final in 2008, and although he didn't get to participate in the penalty shootout, he was at least able to celebrate a European Cup win in his full kit this time. Fast forward even further to 2011, and after winning 10 Premier League titles and at 37 years of age, he decided to finally call it quits for eight months. I guess he hadn't fully scratched his itch, and seeing as how United were going through a bit of a midfield injury crisis, he was welcomed back with open arms. And judging by the fact that these were his stats upon re-entering the league, you can see why Ferguson was so quick to let him back in. He averaged 67 passes a game with a 93.1% pass success rate. The man clearly still had it. Fast forward once more to 2013 after one more Premier League triumph, and this time he was serious. A few months shy of his 39th birthday, for the second and final time, he hung up his boots. At this point, you're probably wondering, but what about Scholes and the English national team? Good question. Well, there isn't much to say, really. Unlike his career at Old Trafford, despite being a regular feature in the national team setup, no silverware made its way to his trophy cabinet at senior level. He made his debut for the English national team in 1997 and made his way into the 1998 World Cup squad playing as an 8, most notably in favour of the likes of Paul Gascoigne and Matt Letizia. England unfortunately crashed out in the first knockout round. Come the 2000 Euros, similarly, Scholes was solidly in the mix, but a group stage exit awaited him. The 2002 World Cup was much better as England made it to the quarterfinals, but again, this ended in disappointment. And then we have the 2004 Euros. Hmm. The cursed left midfielder Scholes. But we, we don't talk about that. This tournament also ended in disappointment, by the way. Following the 2004 Euros at only 29 years of age, Scholes decided to draw the line. Citing his family as his reasoning for this decision, his England career was over. Although, it has been reported that when he was in charge of the national team, Fabio Capello proposed that Scholes return to the national team setup for the 2010 World Cup, a proposition that he rejected. 
but you see, reportedly, Capello only posed the question to him one week before the tournament began and apparently only gave Scholes a few hours to make the decision. He said no, but has since come out and said that had he been given a bit more time to deliberate, he very well could have been on that plane to South Africa. I guess we'll never know what could have happened. So what do we have to say about the guy? Well, to summarize, let's take a look at some of his key stats. Over the course of his career, Paul Scholes made 499 league appearances for Manchester United and 66 appearances for the English national team. This was coupled with 107 goals in the league and 55 assists. Admittedly, not as high as the 177 goals and 102 assists of Frank Lampard and the 120 goals and 92 assists of Steven Gerrard, but still high enough to make Scholes the 26th highest scorer and the 26th highest assister in Premier League history. That's not too bad. Fun fact, he scored at least one goal in every Premier League season that he played in. He played for 19 seasons. He won 11 Premier League trophies, more than any other Englishman, 3 FA Cups, 2 Champions Leagues, and 1 Club World Cup. Oh, and something I haven't even mentioned is that the man was diagnosed with asthma at 21 years of age, had an inflammatory knee disorder from a young age, and struggled with eye and vision related issues from about 30 years of age. He still excelled at ball retention and was one of the most accurate passers of the ball and only retired towards the end of his 30s. Yeah, that's right. This asthmatic, half-blind man is one of the greatest English players of all time and one of the most naturally talented footballers to ever do it. Ladies and gentlemen, the Ginger Prince. And there we have it. What do you guys all think of Paul Scholes? Was he underrated? Was everything I just said waffle? Feel free to leave it all in the comments and make sure you don't hold back on your opinion. Anyway, that's all from me today. Really hope you all enjoyed that one and have a lovely day further. Cheers and I'll catch you in the next one.